that's got to bring back a lot of memories. Yes, it does. Some hard memories, some good memories, camaraderie. Tell us exactly what happened that morning. How did you first hear about what was going on 9-11? Um, that morning, I, uh, well, that night at 8 p.m. the night before, um, I worked, uh, I was a detective in the Organized Crime Control Bureau, Narcotics Division. And so my tour was 8 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. So I had just uh, left work sometime around 4.30, 5.30 a.m., I'm not sure. I get home, want to get some sleep. That's when my night is. And my sister called me shortly after, a couple of hours later, telling me that the first uh, plane hit the World Trade Center and, uh, and to wake up and put on the news. So I wake up. I put on the news immediately. As I, uh, I'm watching the news, I'm just telling her, you know, trying to process, and you're just processing this information. And I say, okay, well, stay where you are. Don't go anywhere. It's probably, you know, maybe an accident, plane hit by accident, too low. And so just stay where you are. And as I was watching it, like probably many of you, on live TV, you just see a plane, dark plane, just come and crash into the second building, you know, the south tower, uh, the, the other tower, and crashes live and, you know, and engulfs in flames. And immediately, as you're seeing it and you hear the, the horror and the news uh, reporters' uh, voices, immediately my, uh, you know, my mind starts to process what just happened, and I knew it was an attack. And when I knew that it was an attack, I told my sister, stay definitely where you are. Don't get on any trains. She worked across the street. She's a pharmacist for Dwayne Reed's. And uh, I said, stay where you are. She worked across the street from Bloomingdale's. No one's really going to go hit Bloomingdale's. So <laughs> I was like, okay, stay where you are. Just don't go near the uh, Empire State Building. And because uh, I figured that would be the next target. So you had an immediate <clears throat> sense that this was a, a state of war. Yes. That we were being attacked from some uh, foreign people. Yes, absolutely. What I, what I thought, is, you know, when we saw that, um, I get out of, you know, I jump out of bed. You know, you just wash your face real quick. My uniform is at uh, the, uh, my uniform is in the closet of my house. Um, because and we're under covers and, and um, we don't wear, you know, a police uniform. It's always inside. You know, we kept it, I kept mine particularly at home. And I dress up real quick and here I was thinking, okay, people are just going to be parachuting down, you know, from airplanes thinking I'm going to war. Mm -hmm. And so let me put on all my gear, my vest, my uniform, and I want it to be distinguished you know, as an American NYPD officer, as opposed to whatever is par going to parachute down. And that was my, you know, that's what so I thought was So mentally, emotionally, you engaged for full-on war. Yes. And, and your instincts proved right in that it was literally an attack against the sovereignty of our nation. Yes. So what did you do? You, you suited up? Suited up. Um, I had to go to my building, which is about 30 blocks away, my, uh, you know, the, uh, the building that we turn out of. Um, and I had to go get my gun and I, when you walked into the building, it was chaos. There was no command structure. There was no chain of command. Um, and you're not used to that greatest police department in the world is now in chaos. People are running out. People are scared. You see the, you know, horror in some people's faces. Everyone's got relatives that work in Manhattan and I got my gun, my lieutenant, uh, one of the lieutenants was there, and, and we said, okay, we got to go. We just have to just get there, and we'll worry about command and structure later and roll call and, you know, all the things that you need to do. Um, just, just, let's just go. So it was me, my lieutenant, and uh, two other guys get into a car, and we start heading down. Uh, we, start get on, we get on a BQE, and we go to the, uh, you know, we want to get to the towers. And... Um, the amazing part of this, you know, there was, there, there's five miracles in this, and it's not a, a sober story that I'm going to be telling you. It's going to be more of, a, you know, where how God has it hand, his hand, and you'll see, because I struggled with this for 14 years, and this struggle 
up until yesterday, and I'll share it with you, but let me just go in order. Sure. Um, you don't realize, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and anybody who's been in the military or first responders, you, you just go with it and you make light of everything that is happening. So at that moment, it's this a is a tragedy, moment. but we're going to go rescue people. Yeah. And nothing's going to happen to me because God's force field is around me. And that's visually what I pictured. Like I'm in this white bubble and nothing is ever going to happen to me. I wasn't married and I didn't have any kids and, you know, uh, you know, Superman, nothing's going to, you know, nothing's what can happen to you. So we get on the BQE with this mind frame. I have to get you uh, into that mind frame of this young kid who's just going to go and rescue people. We get in a BQE, first miracle. I was in the lieutenant. I'm in the right, uh, in the uh, passenger seat behind, uh, the passenger back seat. I'm hearing the calls for help on the police radio. Phones aren't working. Um, radios, you know, aren't working. The tower cell went down, you know, with the hit. It, you know, got hit, so mm -hmm. it's not working. And I'm hearing people calling for help. And, you know, on a police radio, you can just hear the tone and the tone you know is, he doesn't even necessarily need or she necessarily needs to call you hey i need help you just hear it from the tone and you go and you felt like just get there just get there and our first miracle we get on the bqe and on the brooklyn queens expressway it just divides you make a left i'm in the tunnel you make a right i head over to the bridges and the and, the, and queens and at that moment which way, which way, you know, right or left, right or left. I remember them saying, but I was monitoring the radios to figure out, okay, what street, who's the cop? You know, I'm, I'm monitoring the radio at this point. And, uh, and uh, one of the guys goes left, 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 which is the tunnel. We figured that would be the fastest way, which is the fastest way into Manhattan by far, but we didn't realize that that decision was miracle number one. It saved our lives, why? because when we made that left, we got into the tunnel, and <clears throat> in the tunnel, everyone was left their cars after the plane got hit. They left, they stopped, they couldn't get past. The buildings are still up, um, but the debris is you know, only two, three blocks away from the tunnel. And the people just left their cars, and they thought that possibly, you know, the part, uh, the top of the building will fall on the, on the tunnel and crush and people fear, oh, I'm going to drown everything. Right. So they just got sure. up and started running. We meet this, in, you know, the, 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 we, there was an inspector there. So he was the high, highest ranking officer. And since he was the highest ranking officer, you follow his orders. And, and the cops merge together in, in rank and file. And you stand at attention and as if he wanted to do a roll call. But my mind was like, okay, what, what are we wasting time here? Let's just get to the action. I want right. to be where the action is. And, you know, let's see what we can do. And he was like, no, you are to now, your, um, your function is to, basically your mission is to get everyone safely out of the tunnel. We don't want anybody trampling each other. We don't want anybody, um, you know, uh, uh, getting hurt because of the carbon monoxide poisoning. <clears throat> so he gave the order basically to stand down. Basically an invisible boundary. You're not going into the city. You're going to help these people coming out of the yeah. tunnel. You're going to assist them, protect them, help them stay calm. Correct. That's, that was our duty at that point. That was, our, uh, that, that was the order. Basically, stand down. You're not going to Manhattan. You are to stay here, <coughs> and this is what we're doing. Well, Okay, for maybe 10 minutes, I started getting very antsy, and I just want to get to where we go. And we're looking at each other like, seriously, this is what, for real? There's people crying, and, you know, you hear the screams of the other cops, and we we're going to just, you know, you know, basically, I didn't think that was a big deal. Like, people will walk out, let me get to where the real danger is. Well, in your is. mind, they're already safe. They're, they're done. They're you safe. want to put your life in danger to get those who aren't safe. I, I want to get there. I just want to be able to help the people that were screaming on the radio. And um, we, well, when, you know, my phone does, didn't work for quite a while, and all of a sudden I hear it ringing, and, you know, where we're standing on the tunnel, you can see the towers, you have a beautiful view of the water, and there are the towers, and they're burning, and I get a phone call out of nowhere, and it's my sister saying she just got off the phone with, I have two brothers, they're twins, they're nine months younger than me. Um, she gets 
off the phone with one of them saying he was just on the phone with his twin brother, with our, you know, our brother, who was literally only four blocks away from the World Trade Center. And that the last transmission was he couldn't breathe, that there's too much smoke and he can't breathe. Well, the moment I heard that, that became my mission. My mission was to rescue my brother. And it didn't matter what the orders were. I just needed to go and rescue my brother. Now, it's amazing you get this phone call. 230 million calls jam the lines. The cell phone tower's coming down. It's all disrupted. You get a call. Your brother's in distress. Yes. Amazing. That, that is amazing. Um, and it just, by chance, my phone just happened to work, and there are no phones working. So it happened. So I tell my lieutenant, uh, you know, we call him, you know, lieutenant, we call Lou for short. Lou, uh, I need the keys. Give me the keys and, uh, to, to the, the car. To the cop car? Yeah, and the cop car, um, you know, we're narcotics, so our cop cars were the Chevy Impalas, you know, with the little strobe light like you see on TV. And, uh, you know, it doesn't say NYPD anywhere. And it's like, all right, give me the keys. And I thought it would be very simple for him to say, okay, here are the keys, see you later. He said, no, you're ordered to stand down. He gave me an order. And I was like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I need to go get my brother. You have brothers. I know you. You would go. Salim, I can't give you the keys. We were ordered to stand down. I said, Lou, give me the keys. I need the keys. I'm getting my brother. And he, he said something else, and then I called him by his first name. And, you know, when cops call their superior officers by first name, the next step is, you know, either we're going to fight or I'm going to get suspended or something's going to happen. And uh, I was like, John, give me the keys. He saw it in my face, and I would have jumped him, even though he's a little bigger, but I would have got him. I think I would have got that the keys. And um, give me the keys. And he said, he saw it in my eyes, and he said, you stole the keys, okay? As he threw them. You stole the keys. So he's protecting himself from any liabilities. You know, we were given an order. It didn't matter to me. And um, I got the keys. I get in the car. I didn't care about anything else. The radio was on still. My police radio. You got to remember, we, at this time, in 20, 2001, you didn't have smartphones. You didn't have computers on your phone. The radio wasn't working. You don't have live feed anywhere. I'm in a car. I go, I circle around the BQE. I go back to that fork of the road where God saved us. Why did he save us with that left? That was that miracle. Because if I would have made that right and now heading to where I was going, we would definitely be in the towers. 100%. Um, because we would have gotten there early enough and knowing the type of character that I was among, and including myself, we're not going to die. Nothing could ever happen to us. We're going in the tower. And I'm not one to stand by the sideline and just, hey, follow directions. You know, that, that wasn't the kind of cop I am. I was very, you know, hands-on and aggressive. And, so you know, God you detained save. you to save you. Yeah. And then? Make that left. Yeah. Make that left on the fork. Well, now you to go I find myself after. making a right. <laughs> we're, and we're going towards the bridge. And on this bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge that you saw, um, you see all this, you know, you see um, the, 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 the city. And every, everything is in vivid HD color. You have to understand what, what I'm seeing now. People are coming at me. I was the only one heading in the direction where I was heading. The only one. There was no emergency vehicles behind me. There was nothing. I was the only one. Thousands and thousands of people and me dividing them on the bridge just so that I can go. And I had my window down um, just to hear things. And, and as I was traveling on the bridge, I, I just heard people say, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God be with you. God bless you. And, and you know, they're, they're giving, you know, optimism and cheer, like, good, go do your thing. And I also saw people... You know, I heard people, oh, my God, he's crazy. Where are you going? To go back. You know, you don't understand what happened there. And you, you hear these as it's so funny that I'm in a car and there's thousands of people. But you could basically you get this tunnel vision and you can not only see, but you could hear everything. And I'm hearing these things and everything is in color. And as I get towards the other side of the bridge into Manhattan, things start to get gray. People start to get gray. Apparently, the tower fell. 
The second tower that got hit was the first to fall because it got hit in the middle. So the tower fell. I didn't see it fall. I just saw the people now become gray. And I saw that famous cloud of smoke engulf everything in front of me and on the left of me because on the Brooklyn Bridge, the World, Trial, the, the World Trade Centers were on your left. And everything is just gray. And I'm like, what? Like, what I thought is now the, 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 the part where the plane hit and above just collapsed. And where did it collapse, I'm thinking? Hit my brother's building. So I'm like, wow, no way am I accepting this. So I just immediately stopped praying. And at that time, I was Catholic. And I'm saying the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers and every other prayer I could think of. And I'm like, God, please protect my brother. Please protect my brother. You know, just don't let, the, don't let that have fallen on my brother. And I'm thinking the fire department got who they needed to get out. But now, but this is my mission. I need to get my brother because um, my, my parents are going to be calling me any second. My parents were in Lebanon and they're going to be calling me as soon as they get through. And I can't disappoint, you know, them and say, oh, I don't know where he is. And being the older brother, you're, it's, it's your job to protect your younger brothers and sister. And being a cop, it's even more of a uh, reason to do it. So you get to his building. I get, I, I, I run, I stop on Broadway, I get out of the car, I start running. It is smoke, it looks like a war zone. There's no more color. Everything is black and white, basically gray. There is no color. And you said everything went silent. Silent, like if anyone has ever been in a blizzard or a snowstorm, after it snows, you're outside and you walk out, you don't hear anything. It absorbs all the sound. So all Muffled. this dust, all this cloud absorbed all the sound. Everything's black and white. You're in another world. I'm in another world. If it was a scene right out of Terminator, you know, um, that's the only thing I could remember, the first Terminator movie, you know, and it's everything just steal everywhere. Now the question the is, how in the world, in the midst of all of this, you're going to find your brother? You're running down these streets, so you're covered in dust now. You're yes. gray. Yes, yes. How did you find your brother? <laughs> My prayers. Um, I get, you know, I run 15 blocks from where I was. I get into the building, J.P. Morgan Chase, where he was. And I see that the building structure is there and that the debris is on the street, but not on the building. So now I feel more secure and, and actually a little bit more optimistic that he's safe. I get inside and I see hundreds of people in the lobby. And the lobby is very big. I mean, you're talking about a Manhattan building and the lobby is big. And everyone just looked at me like it was like slow motion. And they're like, Who, what, you know, what's happening? And then I, and the head of security comes over and he goes, uh, what do we do? What do we do? He's looking for me t for answers. And I tell him, why is everyone still here? Why didn't you evacuate the building? They're, the building just fell. The second one can fall. You need to get out. And the moment I said, everybody just needs to get out. People didn't even wait for the security. They heard me and then they started running. Now, up until then, the order was to stay put in the building. Stay put in the building. So you make this comment, you're an NYDP, P they hear you, man, and they're out. Yes. NYPD. PD, sorry. <laughs> so we get out. We, I tell, get out, get everybody out, but I need you to, don't go out this way. So I stuck up my hands. And I said, not this way, not towards Broadway. I need you to get out towards the water. For some, you know, God put it on my heart, you know, now that, you know, being a Christian, I understand what, what, where God's got right. his play right. on here. But I felt like just get everyone towards the water and there's going to have to be boats and ferries that are going to come. Just don't get anybody on Broadway because they're going to see what I saw and what I saw, um, you know, we, you know, human remain bodies. I mean, it's, it's tragic. I don't want to get into uh, the details, but I told everybody, get out. Go towards the water. Miracle too. How would I know that? How would I know to get everybody to go towards the water? Not something the police trained for. No, no one in not, their right never mind evacuated ever the building. imagined that this would happen. Yes. So then after that happened, um, the guy's looking at me and he's giving me this, uh, this sheet and I'm wiping my face. And uh, because inside, um, when you kept wiping your faces, you were getting cut. So I had blood on my faces, but I saw a lot of other cops have the old fire, you know, fire and everything, all this weird blood on their faces. Well, where the blood was coming from was the shards of glass, little tiny glass particles and, and steel 
that was in the dust. And every time I would wipe, it would scratch my face. And so he gave me this wet um, rag. So I'm wiping my face, and this guy, one of the, you know, the, the security guy goes, hey, you look like Sebastian. So I look at him, and I'm like, that's who I'm trying to get. Now, you got to understand, among the chaos, everyone is leaving, exiting the building. I'm wiping my face, and this guy says, you look like Sebastian. Your and brother. My brother. How many people work in that building? Oh, there had to be over 1,000 people in that building. So I look at him, and I'm like, that's exactly. So I, I felt God is here. He's going to get my brother. And he says, come with me. So I go with him. I go up seven flights of stairs. My wife's got a much better memory than me because I forgot how many stairs I went. And we go up seven flights of stairs. The moment he opens the door, there's my brother. I would like to, he was under the desk, but he doesn't want me to tell anybody. But he was under the desk. <laughs> He's under the desk. And um, I see him, and it's not like the movies where slow motion, you hug each other, none of that. It's like, yo, what are you doing here? What are you doing? He's asking me a million questions. Uh, enough with the questions. I just need to get you out of here because I need to come back. Mm -hmm. And I was like, come on, come on, come on, come on. He's like, how did you do that? How did you do that? How did you know where I was? What, how, who told you I was here? How did you know what floor I was? And he understands the dynamic because he knows how many people work in this building. To me, it was as simple as coming in, mm -hmm. evacuating a building, making sure to go towards the water, getting my brother, going up flights of stairs, and here's my brother under a desk. Now, if I remember correctly, no one really knows who this security guy was. No, my brother didn't know who it was. Made no connection. No. You know, the Bible says that God's angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are inheriting salvation. And angels will often appear as mere human beings. And uh, the mere fact that this guy sees you covered in dust, all the frenzy, all the excitement, all the terror connects you with your brother and takes you to the very spot where he is. I mean, that alone is quite a miraculous event. That is incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you get your brother out, and there's a lady. And there's a girl, young girl. She is screaming in complete panic and shock. Don't leave me. And she just dug, I remember digging her nails into me, and don't leave me, don't leave me. And I'm like, oh, what? We'll go towards the water. And she's like, no, 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 I need to go with you. She would not leave me. Okay, where do you live? She goes, Dyka Heights. Dyka Heights is only a few minutes from Bay Ridge where I lived. Um, I was like, okay, you, you come with me. And I just, as we were, and I don't remember how I got down from the building. I don't know what stairs I was. I don't remember anything. Everything is blank to me. All I remember is walking back now in color inside the building, back to black and white. Everything's gray. Do not look down. What I saw is very tragic. I'm used to that kind of, you know, not used to, uh, to you know, that, to that kind degree, of degree, but, but I can deal with it better than someone who doesn't, who's never seen someone pass. And, and, and you know, in a graphic, uh, horrible way that they died. And I said, do not look on the floor. There's debris everywhere. We need to keep focused. You need to keep going. Follow me, keep your heads up. My, um, I said, cover your mouths, cover your noses. <clears throat> my brother took off his shirt. He covered his face. He had a T-shirt. I said, give it to the girl. She covered her face, made sure that their heads were kept up, and we go towards the car. I get to the car, put him in the car. I head back. I don't know. Everything is a blur. The building in that time, this sounds like, like an hour you think you'd evacuate a building. This was all under 20 minutes from running when the building first fell, running to 15 blocks, getting there, evacuating the building to the best of my ability, you know, like everyone go back and let them handle it, getting my brother, getting this girl, getting my brother, and running back to the car, which is 15 blocks. And, and I made them hustle to get back. And at some point, the second tower fell. And I don't know when but I was already traveling now back. I was, we were in the car, and you gotta understand the bridge is right there. I never looked back. I don't remember looking back. I'm sure they were looking, and you know they saw smoke and debris. I get to uh, Brooklyn, drop them off. I tell my brother, I gotta go. He goes, where are you going? I said, my day just begun. I gotta get back. You know, I just started right now. And he's like, are you crazy? You, you, you're not even supposed to be working. I was like, I gotta go. Go, go, get out, you know? And he just wants to ask a million other questions, you know? And I was like, just go. 
And so he's got to go, do not make me find you again. Just stay home, you know, and make sure that you're by the phones. Now, because of time, you get back to where all the officers were stood down. Yes. What happened? We get back to the location where the tunnel is, where we were stand down. I, it, it, it was a scene, like, like, a, like maybe 20, 20 officers in, in a huddle, and they saw the car pull up, and they knew it was our car because they told everyone, no, he left, and they thought that one of the transmissions was me, that I, that I perished. And, and one of my partners who loves me to death, you know, he's like, I could have swore it was you. He comes running at me and he's crying and he gives me this hug. And I was like, what are you doing? He goes, dude, I thought you were dead. We all thought you were dead. And, and, and strangers just, you know, cops, you know, we don't know all of them. Oh my God, oh my God. And I'm full of dust, top to bottom. I'm covered. I was in a war zone. These guys are all clean. And it's like, and then you get angry when you see them all clean and we're just supposed to be what? Like just hanging out, guiding traffic basically. Let's go, we gotta go. And I remember the inspector um, doing the sign where you give the motion to release rank and he does the sign and he goes, Godspeed, go. And he released us. And that means you're on your own and you do what you need to do and God be with you basically. And so we got released and um, we turned around. At this point, there's no entering the, the bridge. Now there's tens of thousands of people walking. You can't, you can't, because mm -hmm. if you divide them, they'll fall over. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that, it's that packed, the bridge. Right. So we went to the, the nearest area that we know how to probably get to Manhattan was the actual um, boats, the ferries, the Navy Yard. So we get there, and sure enough, I started seeing all the boats, ferries, straight people with normal boats going in and back. And I thought to myself, I was like, wow, this is going to be a great story. I told these guys to get out that way, you know, good job. You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, wow. But with no foreknowledge. No, no. Just an inspiration, obviously <laughs> divine. God causes these thoughts and words to come out of your mouth, and it becomes the very thing that saves these people. You evacuated that building and sent them to the very spot that was going to be able to exit them the least amount of tra trauma. Yeah, the, um, which Incredible. we find out later, you know, the bosses and when people are talking and, you know, they recognize people's acts that day. And that was one of the things that they had mentioned. And they said, uh, you know that if they would have got out of the building and they would have been walking, going out to Broadway, should they have done that? Building two came down. I was thinking if they were to walk out that way, that people are like, you know, in shock. They're just going to go to the subway, you know? And, and there's no TV anymore. Everything is down. So I'm thinking, they'll probably think like, oh, let me just go on a subway and get back mm -hmm. to Brooklyn or Queens. Mm -hmm. There's no subway. That's it. Everything's right. gone. The lower Manhattan is, is basically a rubble um, where the trade centers is and all the surrounding buildings. So just picture the stadium, our football stadium, three, four times the size of that. And that's that rubble. And that's just ground zero. Mm -hmm. um, so... We get there, we get to Manhattan, and as we're on the ferry boat, we just see that scene, and it was just so surreal, and I get my second phone call, and that was from my wife, Andrea, and uh, she was like, I just want to make sure you're okay, I just need to hear your voice, you're good, okay, you're good, you're good, you're good, and that was just more business, and um, yeah, yeah, it's just crazy. For the uh, next two, three days and more, almost with no sleep, you guys are going through the rubble, looking, trying to hear for cries in the hope that you just might rescue some. Um, incredible story. Would you give him a round of applause, please? <laughs> I have a couple of pictures. If we go to the first picture, we need to move along quickly here. Uh, this first picture, this is Salim and some of the guys after 9-11 that he worked with. Uh, Salim and his homies. The blonde guy is the guy that cried, the big tall one on the left. <laughs> Next photo. This is Salim actively at work. <laughs> Asleep. <laughs> but they had been going round the clock for several days. Next picture. This is the Brooklyn Bridge that he's talking about as the towers are on fire. Next photo. You can see the buildings literally melted and bent to a curved shape. Let's go to the next photo. Absolute war zone. Amazing. Amazing. But you know, <clears throat> Salim put his badge down, 
But a hero never stops being a hero when he puts his badge down. Salim and his wife now own a daycare center and two weeks ago started a Christian school. And we're very proud of you for all of that. You've come here to church, found Christ as your Savior, and God's done a number of miracles in your life. But you're out the front of your daycare center talking to a landscaper, telling him what you want, and all of a sudden, you hear this noise. What do you hear? I'm with the, he's a good guy, uh, he's, he's my landscaper, and we just happen to be in front of our school, in front of the sign by the street. Never really there, but we were deciding on how and where we were going to plant our plants to make pretty up our location. And um, I just hear a breaking noise, and it was a long screech of breaking noise, maybe three, four seconds, which is pretty long, because you usually hear the crash then after a second or two. And then all of a sudden, in the air, I see a car in the air about 25 feet, flipping, turning, landing, going back up, turning, and that was a rotation of seven, full rotation, seven times. Now we have a video, security video. It doesn't show well, but in the background, we're not, we can't show it right now. The car flipped about six or seven times, rolling from side to side to side. No sooner it stops in the video, I saw you in the distance, like a dot, shoot right towards this car. It landed on its wheels, but burst into flames. It's fully on fire, and you're running towards this car. What did you think? What went on? What happened? Um, when the, uh, the car stopped, it was immediately, the engine's on fire. It landed on four wheels, and I just went. You know, I just had to get there, and I just ran to the car. And, uh, and as I was running to the car, I just was praying very quickly and just saying, Lord, please help me right now. Help me. Please don't let this, you know, the, the person in the car, let it be safe. And God, cover me because I know what it's like to try to get somebody out of a car. We've done it a few times. The doors are usually jammed. It's on fire. My wife just got out of the hospital. You know, um, she almost lost her life, you know, the week before at the hospital. And now I'm thinking, are you serious? Now I'm going to, you know, am I going to die now? Like for real? Mm -hmm. My kids just, you know, they need us. And all this is going in my head. And I'm like, and at the same time, I'm thinking, well, Okay, I'm not, you know, just, just protect me, force field again, and, you know, don't let me get burned, and let me just open the car, let it just open up very easily, and all this is seconds, like maybe now, two as seconds. As Salim is talking, if we could have these photos, as a cop, you saw this, a prior cop, you see this car flip six, seven times, you know as it's going from side to side, it's going to be almost impossible to open the doors. And so you prayed, you're thinking, God, how am I going to do this? I'll punch out a window, maybe pull her through the window or something like that. Yeah, I was already thinking, okay, if, I, if the door doesn't open, how am I going to break the window if the window isn't broken? As you're running towards the car, and um, as, it was, as it was happening, so I get to the location. I mean, I get to the car, and it was through the grace of God, the door, as soon as I pulled the lever, it opened. All the glasses broke. The car is crushed. There's a fire the in the engine. The roof is actually like an A-frame. Yeah. Everything got bent out of shape from the photos. As we get into the car, we op I, the door just opened so easily. And then that was the first um, thing that you think about, okay, how am I going to get the door open? This is the inside of the car, totally burnt. And when you got there, wh who was the driver? What happened? There was a, an amazing lady, which I found out her name is Maria later on. And Maria was inside the car. She was unconscious. I opened the door, and I see Maria, a lady inside, probably in her you know, early 50s, and I'm thinking, this could be my mother. And with that energy, it didn't matter what, you can tear a door literally off if you needed to, but the door just opened. God's grace was there, just opened. Then I reach over, and I hit the seatbelt button, just released. So easily. How many people have seatbelts with their kids in the car? You can't even release it, you know? This, is, this was just seven times in the air, and, and uh, it got released. And I remember, wake up, wake up, wake up, just trying to get her to wake up. And I'm thinking, please, God, uh, you know, I don't see 
the swelling that sometimes takes place in brain, you know, in trauma that she could, you know, maybe perished or anything. And she woke up and she opened her eyes and then she started screaming, which is good. That means she's alive, you know? And I was like, this is going to hurt. If I saw you, I would have started screaming too. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that, you know, like you wake up and here's this guy and, and she didn't know what was happening. And, and we, I, I, uh, I reach in and I'm guiding her and then, my friend Alan, the landscaper, he came right behind me and, he, and I was like, we got to get her out. We got to get her out. And I don't know where he was doing. I don't know what I was doing, but we got her out. And we only were able to get her like about five, six feet away. And, the, uh, the, and, and what's amazing is that the, the flames are shooting into the windshield because there is no windshield. And you feel, you feel the heat. And I was like, man, I just don't want to get burnt right now. <laughs> And I was like, well, I'm here, to, you know, you, this is all seconds in your mind and you're not really thinking, you're thinking funny thoughts, but you're like, nope, we're going to get her out. That's it. That's what, that's the focus. Mm -hmm. And we got her out and, you know, we started doing a triage. And then I remember another person came and she was crying and she was afraid of the fire. Mm -hmm. And we were like, you know what, maybe we should move her. Let's just move her again. And we just, and, and, and it, you know, I knew her shoulder was bad. Um, because I could see it, I could see it swelling and her legs and you know, a little blood. And I was like, okay, let's just, let, let's do it. And you don't, you're not supposed to move people in car accidents, but we had to move her away because we were close and the heat was, it was hot. Right. And she started saying the fire, the fire. And she was afraid, um, you know, about the fire. She was concerned. I, uh, I asked you to track her down yes. and we're thrilled to have Maria here today. Maria is going to come to the platform. Would you welcome Maria? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. You're awesome. You are awesome. Maria, God bless you. So, Maria, do you have a nickname for Celine? Oh, sure. I have a lot of nicknames for Celine, but. Uh, yes, Pastor. What is your nickname for Celine? Oh, I say my angel. Your He's angel? My angel, because, yeah, God sent to himself me in that moment. You know, yeah. God always comes on time. He does. Amazing grace. Hey, I asked you if you remember how the accident happened, but from all the trauma, you were unconscious, everything blacked out, you don't remember. But all you know is you woke up to this face. Of course, <laughs> of course. I remember him, and I want to say thank you, God. For who do for me, you know, he sent in this perfect time yeah. to save my life. And yeah. I can believe it. I'm here. I'm fine. That's incredible. I can believe it, yes. We look at the pictures of how that car is so burnt, and we look at you, <laughs> and we can see God's amazing grace, incredible faith operating through this fella. God's yeah. grace on your life, an absolute miracle. Absolute oh, miracle. Absolutely. Yes, Come on, Pastor. give God a big hand of applause. 